Good day everyone. I am Vainyan Ann de Balisteros, taking up the Bachelor of Science major in Physical Education. So, I am here to discuss about the related topics of ethics, which is the meta-ethics and normative ethics. So, first, what is ethics? So, in the field of ethics or moral philosophy, it involves systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of right and wrong behavior. And philosophers today usually divide the ethical theories into three general subject areas. So, these are meta ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics but i will just discuss the two general subject areas which is the math ethics and the normative ethics so in the subjects of math ethics it investigates where our ethical principles come from what do they mean are they merely social inventions? Do they involve more than expressions of our individual emotions? The meta-ethical answers to these questions that focus on the issues of universal truths, the will of God, the role of reason in ethical judgments, and the meaning of ethical terms themselves. So, in normative ethics, pro, it takes on a more practical task which is to arrive at more standards that regulate right and wrong conduct so this may involve articulating the good habits that we should acquire the duties that we should follow or the consequences of our behavior on others so let's talk about and discuss what is Meta ethics. Meta ethics. The term meta means after or beyond, and consequently, the notion of meta ethics that involves remove or bird's eye view of the entire project of ethics. We may define meta ethics as the study of the origin and meaning of ethical concepts. When we compared to normative ethics and applied ethics, the field of meta-ethics is the least precisely defined area of moral philosophy. It also covers issues from moral semant semantics to moral epistemology. So there are two issues. The first one is metaphysical issues concerning whether morality exist independently of humans and psychological issues concerning the underlying metal, mental basis of our moral judgments and conduct. So, let's discuss the first one. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one, metaphysical issues. It is objectivism and relativism. Metaphysics is the study of the kinds of things that exist in the universe. So some things in the universe are made of physical stuff such as rocks. And perhaps other things are non-physical in nature of such as thoughts, spirits, and gods. The metaphysical component of meta-ethics involves discovering especially whether moral values are internal truths that exist in a spirit-like realm or simply human conventions. There are two general directions that discussions of this topic. The, the, the first one is otherworldly and the second one is disworldly. So let's talk about first the otherworldly. The proponents of the otherworldly view 
is typically hold that moral values are objective in the sense that they exist in a spirit-like realm beyond subjective human conventions. They also hold that they are absolute or eternal in that they never change. And also, they are universal in so far as they apply to all rational creatures around the world and throughout time. In, in other words, the most dramatic example of this view is Plato, Plato, who was inspired by the field of mathematics. So when we look at the numbers in mathematical reactions, these seem to be timeless concepts that never change and apply everywhere in the universe. Humans do not invent numbers and human cannot alter them. Plato explained the internal character of mathematics by stating that they are abstract entities that exist in a spirit-like realm. Plato also noted that moral values also are absolute truths and thus are also abstract, spirit-like entities. So in this sense, for Plato, moral values are spiritual objects. In medieval philosophers, they commonly group all moral principles together under the heading of eternal law. So, in this, they frequently seen as spirit-like objects. But in 17th century, British philosopher Samuel Clarke described them as spirit-like relationships rather than spirit-like objects. So, in, the, in either case, though, they exist in a spirit-like realm, a, a different otherworldly approach to the metaphysical status of morality is divine command issuing from God, we, from God's will. So sometimes it calls voluntarism or divine command theory. Who view was inspired by the notion of of an all powerful powerful God who is in control of everything. God simply wills things and they become reality. He was the physical world into existence. He wills human life into existence and similarly he wills all moral values into existence. The proponents of this view, such as medieval philosopher William of Ockham, he believed that God wills moral principles such as murder is wrong, and this exists in God's mind as commands. God informs humans of these commands by implanting us with moral intuitions or revealing these commands in scriptures the second and more is this worldly this approach to the metaphysical status of morality follows in the skeptical philosophical tradition such as the articulated by greek philosopher sectus empiricus he denies the objective status of moral values Technically, skeptics did not reject moral values themselves, but only denied the values exist as spirit-like objects or as divine commands in the mind of God. Moral values, they argued, are strictly human inventions, a position that has seen been, since been called moral relativism. So, the first one is objectivism, and the second one, right now, is relativism. So, there are two distinct forms of moral re relativism. So, the first one is individual relativism, 
which holds that individual people create their own moral standards. Friedrich, for example, he argued that the superhuman creates his or her morality distinct from and in reaction to the slave-like value system of the masses. And the second distinct forms of moral relativism is cultural relativism, which maintains that morality is grounded in the approval of one's society and not simply in the preferences of individual people. So this view was advocated by sex to, and in more recent century by Michel Montaigne and William Graham Sumner. And in addition, by exposing ex skepticism and relativism, these worldly approaches to the metaphysical status of morality deny that the absolute and universal nature of morality holds instead that moral values in fact change from society to society throughout time and throughout the world. So, they frequently attempt to defend their position by scientific examples of bodies that differ dramatically from one culture to another, such as attitude of about polygamy, homosexuality, and human sacrifice. So let's move on from the psychological issues in meta ethics. A second area of meta ethics involves the psychological basis of our moral judgments and conduct, particularly understanding what motivates us to be moral. We might explore this subject by asking the simple question, why be moral? Even if I am aware of basic moral standards, such as don't kill and don't steal, this does not necessarily mean that I will be psychologically compelled to act on them. It's, it's some answers to the questions, why be moral? Why? It is to avoid punishment, to gain praise, to attain happiness, to be dignified, or to fit in with society. So here is the examples of these issues. The first one is egoism and altruism. So, egoism. It is important area of moral, moral psychology concerns the inherent selfishness of humans. In 7th century, British philosopher Thomas Hobbes held that many, if not all, of our actions are prompted by selfish desires. Even if an action seems selfless, such as donating to charity, there are still selfless causes for this, such as experiencing power over other people. This view is called psychological egoism and maintains that self-oriented interests ultimately motivate all human actions. In closely related psychological egoism, that view called psychological hedonism, which is the view that pleasure is the least specific driving force behind of all our actions. Based in 18th century, British philosopher Joseph Butler agreed that the instinctive selfishness and pleasure prompt much of our conduct. However, Butler argued that we also have an inherent psychological capacity to show bene benevolence or benevolence to others. This view is called psychological altruism and maintains that at least of some at least some of our actions are motivated by its instinctive benevolence. 
The second issue is emotion and reason. A second area of moral psychology involves a dispute concerning the role of reason in motivating moral actions. So for example, I make the statement abortion is morally wrong. Am I making a rational assessment or only expressing my feelings? On the one side of the dispute, in 18th century, British philosopher David Hume argued that moral assessments involve our emotions and not our reason. We can amass all the reasons we want, but that alone will not constitute a moral assessment. So we need a distinctly emotional reactions in order to make a moral pronouncement. <coughs> Excuse me. Reason might be of service in giving us the relevant data. But in Hume's words, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions it inspired by Hume's anti-rationalist views because some 20th century philosopher most notably or Ayer similarly denied that moral assessments are factual descriptions so, for example, although the statement, it is good to donate charity, may on the surface look as though it is factual description about charity. It is not. Instead, a moral utterance like this involves two things. First, I, the speaker, I am expressing my personal feelings of approval about charitable donations, and I am, in essence, saying, hooray for charity. Hooray for charity. This is called the emotive element in so far as I am, as I am expressing my emo emotions about some specific behavior. And the second one, I am the speaker, I'm trying to get you to donate charity and I'm essentially giving their or the command donate to charity, donate. So this is called the prescriptive element in the sense that I am prescribing some specific behavior. From Hume's day forward, more rationally minded philosophers have opposed these emotive theories of ethics and instead argued that moral assessments are indeed acts of reasons. In 18th century, German philosopher Immanuel Kant is a case in point. Although emotional factors often do influence our conduct, he argued we should nevertheless resist that kind of sway. Instead, True moral action is motivated only by reason when it is free from emotions and desires. A recent rationalist approach offered by Court Bayer in 1958, he was proposed in direct opposition to the emotivist and prescriptivist theories of Ayer and others. Bayer focuses more bold, broadly on the reasoning and argumentation process that takes place when making moral choices. So, all of our moral choices are, or at least can be, it's backed by some reasons or justifications. So, if I claim that it is wrong to steal someone's car, then I should be able to justify my claim with some kind of of argument. So for example, I could argue that stealing Smith's car is wrong since this would would be upset her. So it will violate her ownership rights or put the fifth 
at risk of getting caught. So, but according to Bagger, then, proper moral decisions making involves giving the best reasons in support of one course of action versus another. So, that is the issues about emotion and reason. Reason. So, let's go to the last reasons or issues, rather. Male and female morality. A third area of moral psychology focuses on whether there is distinctly female approach to ethics that is grounded in the psychological differences between men and women. The discussions of this issue focus on two claims. So the first one is traditional morality is male-centered, and the second one, there is a unique female perspective of the world which can be shaped into a value theory. And according to many feminist philosophers, traditional morality is male-centered since, since it is molded after practices that have been traditionally male-dominated, such as acquiring property, engaging in businesses, contracts, and governing societies. The rigid systems of rules required for trade and government were then taken as models for the creation of equally rigid systems of moral rules, such as lists of rights and duties. Women, by contrast, have traditionally had a nurturing role by raising children and overseeing domestic life. These tasks require less rule following and more spontaneous and creative action. In using the woman's experience as a model for moral theory, then the basis of morality would be spontaneously caring for others as would be appropriate in each unique circumstances. So in this model, the agent becomes part of the situations and acts, caringly within the context. This stands in contrast with male molded, model morality where the agent is a mechanical actor who per performs his required duty but can remain distant from and unaffected by the situation. A care-based care approach to morality, as it is sometimes called, is offered by feminist emphasis as either a replacement for a supplement to traditional male model moral system. So, that's all the topics of Metaethics. So, let's recap about it. So, Metaphysical Issues, Objectivism and Relativism. Psychological Issues in Metaethics. So, the issues there is Egoism and Altruism, Emotion and Reason, and the last one is Male and Female Morality. So let's move on to the topic of normative ethics. Normative ethics involves arriving at moral standards that regulate right and wrong conduct. So in a sense, it is a search for an ideal litmus test of proper behavior. So in this normative ethics, the golden rule is a classic example of a normative principle. We should do to others what we would want others to do to us. So since I do not want my neighbor to steal my car, then it is wrong for me to steal her car. Since I would want people to feed me if I was starving, then I should have feed starving people. Using this same reasoning, 
I can theoretically determine whether any possible action is right or wrong. So, based on the golden rule, it would also be wrong for me to lie, to harass, victimize, assault, or, or kill others. The golden rule is an example of normative theory that establishes a singular principles against which we judge all actions. Other normative theories focus on a set of foundational principles or a set of good character traits. <clears throat> there are the key assumptions in normative ethics. It is that there is only one ultimate criterion of moral conduct, whether it is a single rule or a set of principles. There are three strategies that will be noted here. So the first one is virtue theories, duty theories, and the last one is consequentialist theories. <clears throat> so let's first go to virtue theories. Many philosophers believe that morality consists of following precisely defined rules of conduct, such as don't kill or don't steal. Presumably, I must learn these rules and then make sure of each man, of my actions live up to the rules. In virtue ethics, however, places less emphasis on learning rules and instead stresses the importance of developing good habits of character, such as the benevolence or see moral character. So once I've acquired benevolence, for example, I will then habitually set or act in a normative traditions or in a benevolent manner instead. So historically, virtue theory is one of the oldest normative traditions in Western philosophy, having its root in ancient Greek civilizations. Plato emphasized four virtues in particular, which were later called cardinal virtues. So wisdom, courageous, temperance, and justice. Other important virtues are fortitude, generosity, self-respect, good temper, and sincerity. So in addition to advocating good habits of character, virtue theories hold that we should avoid acquiring bad character traits or vices such as cowardice, insensibility, injustice, and vanity. Virtue theory emphasizes moral education since virtuous character traits are developed in one's youth. Adults, therefore, are responsible for instilling virtues in the young. Aristotle argued that virtues are good habits that we acquire, which regulate our emotions. So, for example, to this. In response to my natural feelings of fear, I should develop the virtue of courage which allow me to be fear when facing danger. Analyzing is specific virtues. So Aristotle argued that most virtues fall away mean between more extreme character traits. With courage, for example, if I do not have enough courage, I develop the disposition of cowardice, which is a vice. If I have too much courage, I develop the dispositions of rashness, which is also a vice. So according to Aristotle, it is not an easy task to find the perfect mean between character or between extreme character traits. In fact, we need assistance for, from our reason to do this. After Aristotle, medieval theolo theologians supplemented 
Greek list of virtues with three Christian ones of theological virtues, which is faith, hope, and charity. The interest in virtue theory continued through the Middle Ages and declined in the 19th century with the rise of alternative moral theories below. So, in the mid-20th century, the virtue theories received a special attention from philosophers who believed that, the, that more recent ethical theories were misguided for focusing too heavily on rules and actions, actions rather than on virtues, character traits. According to Alas Dare McIntyre in 1984, he believed and he also argued. He defended that the central role of virtues in moral theory and argued that virtues are grounded in and emerge from within social traditions. So that is his argument about the virtue theory. So let's move on from the second strategies. Duty theories. Many of us feel that there are clear obligations that we have as a human being so such as to care for our children and to not commit murder duty theories based morality on specific and foundational principles of obligation these theories are sometimes called deontological from their greek word deon or duty in view some or in this view of the foundational nature of our duty or obligation they are also sometimes called non-consequential list since these principles are obligatory irrespective of the consequences that might follow from our actions for example It is wrong to not care of our children even if it results in some great benefits such as financial savings. There are four central duties, duty theories. So the first one. In 17th century, German philosopher Samuel Poffendorf, who classified dozens of duties under three headings. So, the first one, duties to God, duties to oneself, and duties to others. In concerning of our duties towards God, he argued that that there are two kinds. So the first one, a theoretical duty to know the existence and nature of God and a practic practical duty to both inwardly and outwardly worship God. Second, concerning our duties towards oneself. This, these are also of two sorts. The first one, duties of the soul which involve developing one's skills and talents and duties of the body which involve not harming our bodies as we might show gluttony or drunkenness and not killing oneself. Mm -hmm. Concerning our duties towards others, Poffendorf divides this between absolute duties, which are universally binding on people, and conditional duties, 
which are the results of contracts between people. Absolute duties are of three sorts. The first one is avoid wronging others, treat people as equals, and promote the good of others. Conditional duties involve various types of agreements. The principal one of which is the duty is to keep one's promises. So let's move on to the second duty. A second duty based approach to ethics is right theory. So most generally a right is justified claim against another person's behavior such as might right to not be harmed by you. Rights and duties are, are related in such a way that the rights of one person implies the duties of another person. So for example, if I have the right to payment of 100 million, then the one that I get or the one that I have been pay is 100 billion also. So this is called the correlatively of the rights and duties. So the most influential early account of rights theory is that of 17th century British philosopher John Locke who argued that the laws of nature mandate that we should not harm anyone's life, health, liberty, or possessions. For law, these are our natural rights given to us by God. Following law, the United States Declaration of Independence authored by Thomas Jefferson recognizes three foundational rights, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson and others' rights theories maintain that we deduce other more specific rights from this expression. It includes the right of property, movement, speech, and religious. There are four features traditionally associated with moral rights. So the first one. First rights are natural. Natural in so far as they are not invented or created by the government. Second, they are universal in so far as they do not change from country to country. Third, they are equal in the sense that rights are the same for all people, irrespective of gender, race, or handicap. And the fourth one, they are inalienable which means that I cannot hand over my rights to another person, such as by selling myself in slavery, right? So, the second duty is the right theory. So, let's move on to the right, to the third theory of duties theory. A third duty-based theory is that by Kant which emphasizes a singular principle of duty. It influenced by Pufendor, Kant agreed that we have moral duties to oneself and others, such as developing, developing one's talents and keeping our promises to others. However, Kant argued that there is a more foundational principle of duty that encompasses our particular duties. It is a single self-evident principle of reason that he calls the categorical imperative. A categorical imperative that he argued is fundamentally different by hypothetical imperatives that hinge on some personal desire that we have. So for example, if you want to get a good job, then you might go to college. 
then you ought to go to college. That's easy, right? But, by contrast, a categorical, a, a categorical imperative it simply mandates and actions, irrespective of one's personal desires, such as you ought to do. Kant gives at least four versions of the categorical party, but one is especially directed. Treat people as an end, and never as a means to an end. That is, we should always treat people with dignity and never use them as mere instrument. For Kant, we treat people as the end whenever our actions toward someone reflect the inherent value of that person. Just like donating to charity, for example. It is morally correct since this acknowledges the inherent value of the recipient. So by contrast, we treat someone as a means to an end whenever we treat that person as a tool to achieve something else. It is wrong, for example, to steal my neighbor's car since I would be treating her as a means to my own happiness. The categorical imperative also regulates the morality of actions that affect us individually. Suicide, for example, would be wrong since I would be treating my life as a means to alleviation of my misery. Kant believes that the morality of all actions can be determined of appealing to the single principle of duty. The fourth one. A fourth and more recent duty based theory is that by British philosopher W. D. Ross, which emphasizes prima facie duties. Like his seventeenth and eighteenth century counterparts. Ross argues that our duties are part of the fundamental nature of the universe. However, Ross's list of duties is much shorter, which he believes reflects our actual moral convictions. Seven Moral Convictions The first one, fidelity, the duty to keep promises. Second, reparation, the duty to compensate others when we harm them. The third, gratitude. The duty to thank those who help us. Fourth one, justice. The duty to recognize merit. Fifth, beneficence. The duty to improve the conditions of others. Self-improvement. The duty to improve our virtue and intellect. And the last one is Non-maleficence, the duty to not injure others. Ross recognizes that situations will arise when we must choose between two conflicting duties. In a classic example, suppose I borrow my neighbor's gun and promise to return it when he asks, it, when he asks for it. And one day, in a fit of rage, my neighbor pounds on my door and asks for the gun so that he can take vengeance on someone. On the other hand, the duty of fidel fidelity obligates me to return the gun. And on the other hand, the duty of no non-maleficence obligates me to avoid injuring others and does not return the gun. According to Ross, I will intuitively know which of these actions or duties is my actual duty and which is my apparent or prima facie duty. So in this case, my duty is non-maleficence which emerges 
as my actual duty that I should not return the gun. That is the whole content of the duty theory. So let's move on with the consequentialist theories. It is common for us to determine our moral responsibility by weighing the consequences of our actions. According to the consequentialism, correct moral conduct is determined solely by a cost-benefit analysis of an action's consequences. Consequentialism is an action that is morally right if the consequences of that action are more favorable than unfavorable. Consequentialist normative principles require that we first tally both the good and bad consequences of an action. Second, we then determine whether the total good consequences at the way the total bad consequences. If the good consequences are greater, then the action is morally proper. But if the bad consequences are greater, then the action is morally improper. Consequentialist theories are sometimes called the teleological theories from the Greek word telos or end, since the end result of the actions is the sole determining factor of its morality. So, consequentialist theories became popular in the 18th centuries by philosophers who wanted a quick way to morally assess an action by appearing or appealing to experience rather than by appealing to God intuitions or long list of questionable duties. <coughs> Sorry. In fact, the most attractive feature of consequentialism is that it appeals to publicly observable consequences of actions. So there are three subdivisions of consequentialism emerge. So the first one is ethical egoism, an action that is morally right if the consequences of that action are more favorable than unfavorable, only to agent performing the action. Second one, ethical altruism. It is an action that is morally right if the consequences of that action are more favorable than unfavorable to everyone except the agent. So, seeing that difference about ethical egoism and ethical altruism. So, the third one and the last one is utilitarianism. It is an action that is morally, morally right if the consequences of that action are more favorable that unfavorable to everyone. So all of these three theories focus on the consequences of actions for different groups of people. But like all normative theories, the above three theories are rivals of each other because they are they also yield in different conclusions. That's all. I hope that you have learned a lot from this, from the discussions about the meta-ethics and normative ethics. Thank you for watching.